Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar room. We're just getting everything opened up here. Oh, we see a lot of people at joining in already aren't on our attendees list. Okay, so I know a lot of you that are joining in are familiar with Dr. Lonsdorf and her work. And for those of you who are new or just joining us, Dr. Lonsdorf is an integrative physician and recognized Ayurvedic expert. She specializes in women's health issues. Dr. Lonsdorf has been named one of the nation's most prominent Ayurvedic doctors by the Chicago Tribune. She's board certified in integrative and holistic medicine. And over the past 25 years, she's treated over 20,000 patients with Maharshi Ayurveda and integrative medicine approaches. She is the author of The Ageless Woman and the co-author of the best-selling A Woman's Best Medicine. Okay, so we will hand over to Dr. Lonsdorf. Great to see you and be with you this evening. Really excited to share some very important knowledge with you that I've been working with for all of these years with my patients. And I wanted to make sure that you gain some additional understanding today about um, detox and some very important kind of scientifically based knowledge about detox that's critical for he staying healthy, especially in our daily life here in modern world, in modern America, where we have exposure to thousands of toxins on a daily basis. And those are only growing higher and greater in number as time goes on. Those of us who live either in industrial places or in cities or in even, you think out in the country, you would have pure air and toxin-free living, but really agricultural areas, which is a lot of our rural America, are very toxic at certain times of the year, particularly in the spring and early summer, when there are herbicides that are aggressively being sprayed on the fields and also sometimes in the fall, they are also being sprayed. So this is something that can impact our physiology. And I have learned over the years that the Marshi Ayurveda products have been tremendously beneficial for my patients. I use them myself. And I have found that I really don't know how people can keep their bodies pure uh, in an easy way without using these particular products that I'm going to tell you a bit about tonight. But really, I wanted to share with you this knowledge of detox. And I also, um, it turns out we, we have a lot of things we promised you. And I'm going to try to touch at least briefly on all of them because uh, I know that you're interested in them all, and yet we have only a shorter time than I thought for tonight, so we don't want to keep you really long. So some of them I'm going to give just short uh, snippets about, and then I'm going to focus on these main points about detox that I think might be new to you. <clears throat> so in addition to the concept of exposure that we may get in modern life to different toxins in the environment, we also know in Ayurveda that we can create toxins from within. We can create them from not digesting our food properly and yet absorbing some of those undigested molecules. That's called ama. And it's very akin to the, co the common expression that we have now or knowledge about what's called so-called leaky gut, that the food not being properly digested or being impure in some way can irritate the gut lining. And then the gut lining, instead of being a nice, very um, proper per semi-permeable membrane through which only the good, completely broken down nutrients get absorbed, the undigested nutrients and the waste stay inside the intestine and go out through our waste. Instead, so much um, exposure to these irritating substances today is happening that many people are getting what's called leaky gut and that membrane that lines the intestine and serves as a barrier between the intestinal contents like food and what we've digested and actually what we absorb that has been compromised 
and it's letting in food that's not completely digested, may let in impurities, and that can lead to the deposition of impure substances within our tissues. And Ayurveda describes, and now leaky gut theorists describe, that this can lead to inflammation such as joint problems and respiratory problems and autoimmune problems and probably a lot of other problems. So we want to talk tonight a little bit about this kind of ama, it's called, this from undigested food and also from impurities that either we create from inside of us or that we ingest from outside of us. And then what can we do about those if we feel that we have symptoms of that? So I'd like to start with a slideshow and I'm gonna apologize in advance that I'm going to skip around a bit just for time's sake and to hit the high points that are most important. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I'm going to bring up the slideshow, which is right here. There we go. And it turns out, um, here we go, the, the, the first title slide I have here is just, heads up, your genes are changing. I wanted to draw attention to the fact that at a certain time of the year, which is right now, just coming to a conclusion in the next couple of weeks. But we've been in the springtime. And in the springtime, by the way, I want to double check everyone can see my slides. So if you, can, if you can or can't, please just chat so that Val can see that and she can let me know if there's any problem. Yeah, I, I think we can see it from our end. And yeah, just send a chat. We've had a couple of people chatting in. So let us know if y'all are having any issues seeing. Okay, great. So. Um, the other important thing that we want to know about is the fact that our body has a natural detoxification system. You know, we don't have to take an herb or take a cleanse or fiber or anything particular in order to cleanse because our body naturally knows how to eliminate waste and is constantly trying to keep itself clean from a cellular level all the way up to the, the major body level. And our body actually has cycles and in the springtime, it turns out, it's a really important point um, that we need to support our physiology in its natural cleansing because, see Ayurveda has said that the springtime, the body naturally eliminates the buildup of the doshas that have happened over the winter. And it's as if snow is melting in the mountains and starts to flow. It says that in the spring, as the body starts to warm up and the weather warms up, the impurities and such that have been kind of stuck in the tissues because we've been kind of tight and closed up trying to keep warm, those things start to dissolve and the circulation starts to increase. Those impurities start to melt and flow out. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but some of my patients say, you know, they notice a subtle flow or a subtle change around the equinox in the spring. And, and when they know this principle, they go, ah, yeah, this is the flow. This is my body starting to open up and starting to get rid of the impurities. So how we can support that and why I want to go into it a little bit tonight. So the first thing is, which was a revelation to me, is that your genes are changing. And I actually didn't learn this until a couple years ago. I gave a talk in Holland at the International Ayurveda Congress, and I gave a talk on chronobiology and the fact that the body changes throughout the 24-hour cycle, and therefore eating at certain times is more appropriate, and going to bed at certain times, and getting up and exercising at certain times is appropriate. Now, that would have sounded kind of and did very esoteric and like overly particular years ago. Modern medicine would have kind of rolled their eyes. And yet we've known from Ayurveda that there are optimal times to do these things in the day that support our health and our best digestion, best elimination, best energy. So it turns out that research in the past 20 years has started actually probably the last five to 10 years has started to look into the timing of things and found that indeed, if we eat our main meal 
early in the day, we're more likely to lose weight easily and keep the weight off and lose it more quickly. And exposure to light in the morning is very healthy for us. It turns out it actually influences our metabolism. So I knew about this and I was talking about it, but I thought, you know, it's going to be a while before modern medicine even starts to think about studying seasonal change, which Ayurveda says is another important counterpart to daily routine and the change in the circadian cycle over 24 hours. But I had a colleague who shortly after that conference sent me a, pa a paper that indeed documented just that phenomenon. And it's so fascinating and it's so important that I wanted to share that with you today, especially as we're just finishing, we're just coming out of a very, very critical time, this springtime, and we're going to go into it again in the fall in the reverse. So I want you to understand what's happening, why Ayurveda says that this is such a critical time of the year. Well, this is just saying that our brain knows what time it is according to the light and the sun coming up and going down. And of course, it creates melatonin, which helps us sleep. And in the morning, it creates cortisol, which helps us wake up and face the day. So our, we have body clock, this main clock in our brain, but every cell, nearly every cell has been found. And I think eventually they'll find every cell has a clock inside it. So every cell knows what time it is. It knows what it's supposed to be doing. It knows what the rest of the body is doing. And every day that gets resynchronized when the sun comes up and the sun rises and that light starts hitting our brain. All the cells get resynchronized. It's just like bringing everything back uh, according to like, um, you know, global time. So <clears throat> here, in what I wanted to show you here is actually a plot of the activity of certain genes. This is a particular gene, a set of different genes. And what we find here is that some of these genes, oops, sorry about that. Some of these, oops, I thought I'd have a, a <laughs> I would be able to show you something with a pointer, but I guess that doesn't work. So as you see, some of the genes in the middle are going right across the screen kind of horizontal, but and you see on the, the axis of the bottom, it's January through December. And on the left is relative expression. That means the activity of this, these genes, these, these four genes here. But the green and the red lines indicate two other genes that actually, if you look at January and February, they're very low. They're below the average horizontal. And then around April, they're zooming up, the end of March, they start zooming up, they cross the horizontal, and then in the middle of the summer, June, July, August, they are at a huge peak. They're at a big peak. Isn't that fascinating? And this paper that came out a couple years ago documented that there's widespread seasonal gene expression that varies in many of our genes, especially those in our immune system. And this fascinating uh, diagram, each one of these black lines is the activity of one, a different gene. And they plotted 4,027 genes they found actually vary in their activity dramatically between summer and winter. So look, here in January, February, you've got a whole bunch of genes that are way above the line, and then you've got a whole bunch of genes that are below the horizontal. But around April, May into June, these lines converge, and you have this node here where the, the upper ones are coming down and the lower ones are going up, and they meet at this time of year. So this is a critical time when we have a massive transition in 4,000 of our genes, which is almost, you know, almost a fifth of our genes. Say it's a sixth of all of our genes are changing dramatically. So no wonder why Ayurveda said in the spring and in the fall is a really important time to follow a good diet, not overload our system, pay attention to our digestion, and help our body to naturally shift and detox. It's not a time to be putting a lot of extra stress and load of toxins or heavy food on our body. We have to help it make this transition. 
It's amazing, isn't it, how wise Ayurveda is? It's just really, truly tapping into a very, very deep knowledge of human physiology and its relation to the environment. When I first started 30 years ago, that was just a concept. And now we have this research, burgeoning field of research that is validating Ayurvedic principles right and left. So here's just another uh, depiction in a graph of all these genes and the changing activity. And here's another one on seasonal genes, especially in asthma patients. And you see on the left, you've got the blue that's going up in the middle in the summer and the green that's going down in the summer. So it's just another way to color code these changes in the genes and their activity. And everyone here probably knows Ayurveda is the longest continuously practiced medical system and it's yoga's sister health science. They both originate from the Veda. That is the blueprint of knowledge of all life, all manifestation, all creation that's there in the unified field, we could say. It's there in the virtual field from which physics says everything is created. And the Ayurvedic knew that basic structure so many thousands of years ago. This is just a little cartoon to say how I discovered the importance of digestion before I learned about Ayurveda, shortly before I learned about Ayurveda. And I'm bringing up digestion here because we wanted to talk about the allergies a lot of people experience at these times of the year, this time of the year, and often at season change in the spring and in the fall. And it turns out Ayurveda describes that, you know, our immune system is going through a tremendous flux. Many of those genes that we were just looking at that are changing our immune genes, and they're going from a state of hyperactivity and increased inflammation in the winter, probably because our body gets exposed to very dangerous germs in the winter more than the summer. And in the summer, that cycle of inflammation and excess or hyperimmune activity calms down. So it turns out that a lot of allergy problems come from what's called ama. And we're gonna talk about two kinds of ama today. Uh, classic ama, which is heavy and sluggish, and pitta charged ama, which is more reactive. We're gonna talk about those two kinds of ama and how we use different products and different dietary recommendations for each of those. And I wanted to emphasize to you that we want to eliminate ama, we want to minimize any ama formation. We want to, in other words, the opposite of that is we wanna maximize perfect digestion. So what we absorb is really broken down building blocks, the purest building blocks that our body tissues need to rebuild themselves, to run our metabolism, to detoxify, and not bring in uh, molecules that are only partially broken down and like a, a impurity or a toxin to the body. So anyway, I discovered through Ayurveda that, um, well, I discovered through eating hospital food that that's not a good thing for digestion. And as I was an intern, I started to have digestive problems that I'd never had in my whole life. And I also found that my mood was not as good. It turns out that intestinal health and bacteria are very key to our mood. So physician heal thyself, I decided that I would try an Ayurvedic clinic. This was back in 1985 for a cleanse. And being uh, if you're from Wisconsin in the Midwest, please don't take this as anything other than just kind of a, a dig at our, our um, kind of our roots that are more traditional. But um, being from Wisconsin, I never even had a massage. I had never heard of a cleanse. And I never imagined that I go to a spa in my life. But I heard from friends that there was a clinic in Iowa where they do this cleanse and you feel so much better and it's so amazing and I thought okay I'm an intern I'm tired I'm out of balance my digestion's off I don't feel happy let me go and check this out and what I discovered was that that treatment which is detox and improving digestion was so effective for me that I felt better for months so un unlike most, you know, you go on a vacation for a long weekend or something, you feel, you feel better for those days and you come back and after a couple of days back at work, it kind of all disappears. But this was something really different. This fundamentally changed my physiology. It really truly helped my body heal itself. And I was experiencing the benefits for months. And what I decided at that time was this type of medicine truly makes you healthy. And Western medicine, which I'd studied already for almost six, uh, six plus years, 
doesn't, you know, it treats disease to control it, but it doesn't truly heal. It doesn't really make you healthy. So I wanted to learn what would make people healthy. And it turns out that Hippocrates, who's also considered the father of modern medicine, said that all disease begins in the gut. And Ayurveda agrees. It says that digestion, good digestion, in a healthy digestive tract is the key to longevity and key to good health for a lifetime. So now that's being recognized in Western medicine. It wasn't even a concept it, you know, 10, 15 years ago. It wasn't anything known other than in the Ayurvedic circles that I knew or naturopathic circles. But now it's uh, the gut health is kind of the new um, brainchild of, of enter gastroenterologists and they're all excited about the microbiome and gut health. And I could go into all the details, but we all know that um, about 70 to a percent of our immune systems in the gut, our gut provides 80% uh, of the serotonin, the feel good neurotransmitter that supports our mood and all sorts of um, vital functions are uh, performed by the bacteria in our gut. There's also half a billion neurons in our gut so our gut, when we have a gut feeling, we do really have a feeling that takes into account a tremendous amount of information and synthesizes that into that feeling. And problems with food allergies and intolerances are rampant today. Almost everybody, every other person's on a gluten-free diet for one reason or another. Wheat, fructose are also common allergies and corn and soy. So what Ayurveda would say is these have their solution they have their source in the fact that people are not digesting well and they're not getting rid of impurities. And signs and symptoms of this condition, which Ayurveda would say would be clogged channels or the buildup of ama in the tissues, clogging the flow so that nutrients aren't getting properly to the tissues, waste aren't getting out. So that's less strength and stamina, fatigue, heaviness in the body, getting up, waking in the morning, feeling not refreshed, congested, achy, stiff, having indigestion, constipation, lack of, of really good uh, immunity and good hunger and coating on the tongue are just some of the symptoms. Question we said we promised, does dairy cause more mucus? Actually, I think that it probably does. Many people I know experience, they have some, especially cold dairy, sweet cold dairy, like ice cream or frozen yogurt or cold milk, they'll immediately start to drain mucus. But the studies so far in Western medicine show that dairy does make phlegm thicker and possibly more irritating. And irritating may create more phlegm because the body's trying to protect itself from that irritation. So we do know now that dairy does promote mucus and kapha, excess kapha. And if it's thick, Ayurveda says mucus that's thin and is playing a proper role, like just to cleanse the, digest, uh, the respiratory tract occasionally with a good sneeze, Maybe there was something in the air and it's cleansing, but if it starts to be a problem constantly or the phlegm becomes thick, that's a sign of ama and that congestion tied to poor digestion. So we all know digestion's breaking down the food, enzymes and, and mechanical from chewing and also acidic activity that breaks the food down. So we all know digestion produces our energy, our body tissues, and if we don't digest well, we get these toxic impurities. So basically diet is one of the most important things and what we eat when, and I think if you go on the Moppy website, there's tremendous amount of wonderful information about how to eat and tips for diet, tips for eating habits to digest properly. So in short, both Western and Ayurveda agree we need a whole food diet we need to avoid junk foods fast foods processed foods bad fats and we need now they agree high quality plant-based oils and fats which they were not saying was good before everything had to be fat free and now of course ayurveda has said we need an unctuous diet oily but good wholesome oils so now western medicine also agrees so ayurvedic added dimension Favor easy to digest foods, limit cheese and meat, never eat those at night, never eat yogurt at night. They're too heavy and clog the channels. So we have to eat the right foods at the right time of day. And also according to our digestive ability, our body nature, which is partly genetically determined, 
and our digestive type. Are we out of balance in our digestion that we need certain types of foods and preparation over others? So this I'm going to skip over. We talked about leaky gut. Um, there's all sorts of principles of how to improve your digestion that you can find on the Moppy website. I'm going to highlight right here is to include spices and herbs in your cooking um, and to sip warm water with meals. So those two things uh, are very, very helpful to promote good digestion and avoiding cold foods and drinks with your meal. And why? Because, yes, I heard somebody say, just kidding, I heard you say that there was digestion is chemistry, and chemistry takes place best at what temperature? Yes, hot temperatures. If you want something to uh, proceed quickly, to, to break down, you boil it in the pan or you heat it on the stove or in a laboratory, you put it under a Bunsen, over a Bunsen burner, which is a little flame. And if you want to preserve something, what do you do with it? Yeah, you put it on ice, you put it in the freezer, you put it in the refrigerator. So we don't want to preserve the food when we put it in our stomach. We want to break it down. So we want warmth. We want that, that our enzymes and acids will work better in that warm temperature. So as I mentioned, Ayurveda describes different types of toxins. Ama, which is this like waste, chemical, uh, non-chemical de debris, these molecules that aren't fully broken down, maybe from eating cheese, you feel congested, you feel sticky, you feel heavy. That would be from eating too much of a, a heavy kind of food you don't digest. Now that's bad enough, but ama visha is really the potentially dangerous kind of ama, even in the short term, because it is chemically reactive, creates free radicals, and it can really damage our, even our DNA and lead to mutations and such. It also promotes rapid aging. So amavisha is this chemically reactive ama, and garavisha are those kind of chemicals that come from outside the body. Slow poison, they're called, and xenobiotics. They're from the environment, like uh, farm chemicals or some diesel fuel you breathe in or exhaust in a city those kinds of uh, toxins. So what category are you? I'll just say, I'm gonna read a few symptoms. The bottom line is in choosing what detox products to use and how to adjust your diet is, do you have the chemically reactive kind of AMA predominant or do you have the sluggish, cloggy, non-chemically reactive type being more prominent? So a couple symptoms for the reactive kind, ama and garavisha, basically it can cause kind of like nausea for no reason. It can cause hyperacidity, any burning sensation in the gut, for example. And another classic one would be any kind of rash, any kind of rash, breakout on the skin and the face. Those things are prominently um, symptoms when there's um, amavisha, sometimes dryness, because there, there's a pitta quality, there's a chemically active quality to this. So, um, and often sensitivities and food intolerances, particularly with skin reactions. Now, the other one would be classic ama. The classic ama, the non-reactive, heavy, cloggy ama, you wake up tired even after good night's sleep, you might have a lot of congestion, trouble breathing. Maybe you have asthma or bronchitis a lot. Um, there's that feeling of mental fatigue, just like dull mind, um, feeling heavy in the body, like going up the stairs or, or getting up in the morning is this heavy stiffness. And also often there's indigestion that has to do with like heavy sits in your stomach. Any kind of feeling like that of heaviness, blockage, congestion, those are all usually classic ama. So how do we get rid of those? For the classic ama, we need to stoke the digestive fire. So ginger root, as you see a picture on the right, ginger root is fantastic. You can take grated ginger and have it with a little uh, squirt of le fresh lemon juice and rock salt before the meal. You can also put ginger in hot water and like fresh ginger slices in hot water and drink that throughout the day. You can start the day with hot water, warm water with lemon in it, 
on an empty stomach. That's a wonderful way to help your body burn off the ama. And you want to avoid the cheese, the yogurt, the ice cream, the, the dairy, and anything cold. Drink hot water through the day with like ginger, ginger tea, we call it. Now, amavisha, that's all those chemically reactive toxins. And for that, you, this is when the green juices are good. Green juices are not so great for people with the first type of ama because they're cooling, maybe a little too cooling. People drink them cold. It's uh, not as ideal as for this. The green juices, um, easily digested diet with lots of fruits and vegetables that have natural detox and antioxidant ability and avoiding alcohol, which adds a really powerful external toxin to the liver, artificial chemicals, recreational drugs, all those should be avoided. And Garavisha, you want to do all of the above, plus support the body with phase one and phase two detoxification. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that next. This is the last point here in the webinar before we take some questions. This is an extremely important thing to understand, and it seems complex at first, but I just want to point out that there's basically two steps to getting rid of toxins in our body. Say we breathed in something, it was um, some chemical from the air, and our body's going, eh, we got to get rid of this. Uh, we don't like this. This is irritating to the body. We got it. We got to get rid of it. Well, if it's water soluble, the body immediately can flush it out through the kidneys or pretty easily through the, the liver. It's, it's pretty quick to get rid of it. But if it's not water soluble, then we have to make it water soluble. And you might know that fat soluble things don't uh, dissolve well in water, right? If you put oil in pour some oil and a glass of water, it beads up and sits on the top, right? It doesn't mix easily. They don't mix. They're, they're kind of um, built to resist each other. So if we have a toxin that's lipid and it has to become water-based or water-soluble to get out of the body, basically phase one is making a toxin water-soluble. It was fat soluble, you've got to convert it, you've got to make it water soluble. And you can see a list here on the left of many of the common chemicals that we come across that are actually fat soluble. So metabolic end products of our own tissue, that's type we're talking about internally generated toxins, microorganisms, many bacteria and contaminants, pollutants, insecticides and pesticides, many food add additives, drugs and alcohol. So all those kinds of substances have to be made water soluble. Now the, the downside of this is, you know, the upside is our liver knows how to do this. But the downside is that phase one actually makes it more chemically reactive and more toxic. So that's necessary because then you're going to make it water soluble is two steps. One, you have to make it more reactive chemically because water, I mean, oil is not very chemically reactive isolates itself as we saw in the water it kind of clumps together and doesn't do anything so we have to make it like lively and able to react because then we're going to add some kind of additional conjugation conjugants as they're called we're going to add a little a little uh, chemical like we could say um, a little appendage to that molecule that makes it water soluble but first we have to make it reactive and ready to react with that and like conjugate, like, yeah, make it part of its own molecule. So phase one makes it reactive, which we got we to gotta get rid of that fast because we don't want a bunch of more reactive stuff around the body. Then we got to conjugate it. Boop. We conjugate it and neutralizes it and it makes it water soluble and then it goes out of the body. So isn't that beautiful? The, the body has this understanding of how to get rid of these toxins that appeared man-made, you know, many hundreds of thousands of years after, you know, humankind was born. So we have phase one and phase two. So we need the ability to create this active molecule, reactive molecule, and then we have to have these conjugants. 
You have to have the ability to conjugate it. So every person, depending on their genetics and whether they have mutations or um, what they inherited, we may do these phases better or we may do them more poorly. And it turns out the beauty of this knowledge is that certain herbs and certain spices and foods can actually help support us to have good detox in phase one and phase two. What we want is healthy phase one and, and, and robust phase two, so they work together and get those toxins out quickly. So I just described this. This is a lot of words that probably just be more complicated. So I want to tell you that if you want to determine how, the strength of your phase one and phase two, you can ask yourself a couple questions. And then I'm going to give you, make a note of this, because then I'm going to give you a few points on how to enhance your detox, depending on which phase you might have a little weakness on. So phase one, that becoming reactive, if you're very sensitive to caffeine, you may not convert your, um, your molecules that well into water soluble. So a few sips keeps you weight, then you need to support your phase one detox. And these are some of the foods that really help with that. All the cruciferous cabbage vegetables and a high protein diet and oranges and tangerines actually help with this. These nutrients, B vitamins and vitamin C and special herbs like caraway and dill, milk thistle and sassafras tea and avoid these things which your body just inherently is not so good at getting rid of like charcoal broiled foods, especially meat, pesticides, paints, and exhaust fumes. So if you're one of those people who's really sensitive to all these things, you know you need to shore up your phase one liver detox and favor these uh, plants, these cabbage family vegetables, and get enough protein. I can't emphasize that enough. I did research on this with dozens and dozens of my patients who turned out they were vegetarian and they were not getting enough protein. You can get enough protein as a vegetarian, but you have to really be mindful of what you're eating and work at it. You have to be sure you're getting at least 50 to 70 grams of protein a day. And most of my patients were not anywhere near that. They were low in even essential amino acids. And almost all of those people are chemically sensitive. They are not protected from toxins because they're not eating enough protein, which gives you the building blocks in the liver to create these enzymes that do the process. What is an enzyme? An enzyme is a protein. We can't build our enzymes if we don't have the essential amino acids in proper quantity. So B vitamins and cysteine, methionine, these choline, these are found often in eggs, very well in eggs magnesium and iron, we need minerals, and antioxidants, glutathione is our major uh, antioxidant and enzyme for detox, but you have to make it from foods and nutrients like cysteine and because it doesn't survive very well the GI tract if you take it as a supplement. Catechins found in green tea are also very good. They will also be found in decaf green tea. So sensitive caffeine increase all these things. Now, if you handle caffeine easily, that means you're making these reactive chemicals very easily, but they need to get neutralized very quickly by these little appendages, these conjugates. So in other words, make sure you can, you can take care and, and neutralize those toxic molecules you made. So for that, if you find that garlic makes you sick, Urine has a strong smell after asparagus. Actually, I think that's true for most people. There's somewhat of a smell, um, but really strong would be um, perhaps some weakness in this phase two. Toxemia during pregnancy is associated with it, and strong reaction to toxins means that you're not only sluggish in creating, you know, getting rid of the toxins, but you're making your toxins more toxic in phase one, and you're not neutralizing them quickly with phase two. So, um, in this case, if you're made sick so easily by all these things, turmeric is a beautiful, beautiful way to help support your body because it reduces, it, it, it tones down that phase one 
creating those agitated molecules a little bit. It's not going to turn it off, but it'll mod modulate it and it'll increase your phase two so you can neutralize them quickly. Uh, sulfa amino acids and glutathione um, precursors like glutamine and glycine. Choline, eggs are good, N-acetylcysteine, bee pollen, blue-green algae, fish oils, cruciferous vegetables. Again, they're good for both phase one and phase two. Now here's where garlic, shallots, onions are important because a lot of this is sulfur-based and vegetarians who are yogis often don't eat garlic or onions. So I wanna encourage you to begin to add at least leek, which is yogically basically okay. So leek is another good source of sulfur. You don't wanna be low in sulfur and uh, some of my patients I have found are low in that. Also, you need plenty of B12, which also vegetarians often get low in. SAMe is a possibility um, to support this. Uh, and, and minimizing aspirin and Aleve and other non-steroidals. And also low-fat dieting. You want to have enough fat in your diet to help you with the phase two detox. So are you overloaded with toxins? It can be a mild or it could be even a severe. I have some patients when... They are exposed to farm chemicals in the spring. All of a sudden, maybe they went out and took a walk to the mailbox one day and they didn't realize they were spraying that day. They can't smell anything in the air and they come back and a few hours later, they're hit with a headache. They feel like they're getting sick. They don't know why they feel bad. They go lie down. They feel their whole body is, is like off and vibrating and, and they feel blah and sick. And it turns out that when I've counseled them to do this detox, to take some of the products I'm going to tell you about in a minute, um, flush their system. They feel better within a day. It wasn't a flu. It wasn't a virus. It ended up, it was just a toxic exposure. And I just wanted to share this with you because I th thought it was such a beautiful realization in this particular paper, paper about um, detox and what it said is surprisingly, not to us because we know Ayurveda, we're not surprised, so some dietary plant extracts show profound inducing capability for detox as compared to pure compounds, indicating combinatorial or synergistic effects of compounds found in whole foods. Isn't that a revelation? Thank goodness the you know, Western medical model and scientific model of, oh, isolated ingredient, this one act, what's the active ingredient? What's doing it? And what's the just waste? You know, what's not important? Well, everything's important and everything is supporting the power of the plant's activity. And they're finally starting to discover that. So here's um, my favorite products for detox. Uh, first of all, the nectar, which is ombret. Amrit has two formulas called Ambrosia One, little tablets, which are really good to take before you meditate because they help support your neurological system. Uh, they also help with your adrenal system. They're just a really good resina for your mind, brain, nerves, and adrenals. Or, but in case of detox, I particularly recommend the other formula called the Nectar. Uh, the paste is a dark paste. It has some ghee and sugar in it, so some people have to avoid that for various reasons, and it may be a little heavy for people to digest. So I generally recommend the tablet form of it to most of my patients because their digestion may be a little weak, and they need to use their energy of digestion for detox. So nectar tablets, one twice a day, or if, they're, if you're exposed to a toxin, two twice a day or even three times a day, um, I found it... I call it balance in a jar. This is the premier rejuvenative of Ayurveda. It's present, its formula is present in the ancient Ayurvedic texts. And when Maharishi established in Maharishi Ayurveda and brought the very best Ayurvedic physicians from all over India to talk about restoring the authenticity of Ayurveda in its fullness, they he asked them, what is the one formula that people can take that will rejuvenate them, that will help protect them from all disease and help them live a long, healthy life. And they said, this is the premier formula. Only problem is it hasn't been made in our generation. 
And it's really to the credit of Marsh Ayurveda products back in the mid 1980s, before any other company here in the US was really established on the same level of professionalism, that they created, recreated, they, re they remade or they began to make, because these ingredients were very hard to find, they created this formula again and made it and found the ingredients and grew them in wild crafting if they needed to. And they have been creating it as in, in its authentic form now for over 30 years. And we're enjoying the benefits of that. A lot of research on it. So it's nectar tablets. Then one of my favorite compounds for the Amavisha, if you have the skin rashes, you have the uh, heartburn, the, the irritability, the the feelings, um, the, the inflammation from toxic exposure. And Limtoxo is the best. It is cooling. It's really anti-inflammatory. It supports both your liver and your kidneys in flushing out the toxins. It's an amazing product. And anybody who lives around a lot of chemicals or there are seasons where you get exposed to a lot, during that time, I highly recommend you take a Limtoxo every day um, you know, these recommendations, by the way, you need to check with your doctor. If you have health conditions or you're taking a bunch of medicine or anything for your heart or any important uh, organ system, even if you have high blood pressure, you need to check with your doctor to see if these are appropriate for you or could alter how your, your medication is processed by your body. Because body sees drugs as like a toxin. But I'm just saying this, if you're a healthy person, you're not taking medication, these are general recommendations, and you have to see what works for you um, and what you feel comfortable with. But these, this is what I use uh, in my practice with the applying the knowledge I have to match these to the person and their situation. But I'm telling you generically how I use these. So Limtoxo I use when there's a lot of inflammation, a person has skin reactions and rashes and, and, and that sort of thing. Genitrac also is very good, like Elimtoxo, it especially helps through the kidneys. So sometimes people get achy kidneys in the, in the summer if they're exposed to toxins or whenever they are. This, like Elimtoxo, has Gaduchi in it, which eliminates both internally and externally acquired toxins. It's a fabulous herb, very balancing for the liver very helpful for the de detox. And I wanted to also mention coriander seed and cilantro. So using these, grind this up, use it with your food, put fresh cilantro with your food. That's a, an amazingly supportive herb and spice for detox. You can even make tea with coriander in it. Just boil water, drop some coriander seeds in it and drink that through the day. You can add a few leaves of cilantro as well. So this brings us um, to the conclusion of this webinar. We'll take a few questions. We have a few more minutes. And I wanted to just mention that uh, you, can get, um, you can get help for your digestion through uh, personalized tips that I give on my website. It's at um, drlonsdorf.com, or if that's hard for you to remember, go to drnancyhealth, drnancyhealth.com. And you can take a quiz for your digestion, find out which it will put you in a category of vata, pitta, or kapha, or airy, fiery, or earthy digestion type. And it will send you then a tip once a week for six weeks so you can gradually integrate recommendations that will help support your digestion, which will help with reducing allergies and congestion, help your body to become uh, more balanced naturally. And we know that digestion is a foundation of good immunity. It's also the foundation of good mood and foundation of longevity and anti-aging. I also wanted to mention that if you're dealing with stress, I don't know who isn't today, but you can also find out your stress type with another quiz on my website, drnancyhealth.com. You can relieve stress by taking a quick quiz and then you'll get a tip once a week for six weeks that will help you to cope with stress the way you experience stress. Because Ayurveda says there are three main stress types and I bet you can guess that that has something to do with the three doshas. So um, also I teach Ayurveda, ayurveda-courses.org. You can 
learn from Dr. Rothenberg and myself as a wellness consultant for you, your family, for people that you have in your coaching business, if you have one of those, or um, if you're a health professional, that's what the course was originally designed for. And we teach doctors and chiropractors and all sorts of health professionals so they can add this knowledge to their healing toolbox. So Wonderful. Dr. Monster, will you leave this slide up as well? Because we did have some people ask about online consultations with you, or if, if you're in Fairfield, they can see you in person. Yes, that's right. And, and I will say, um, you can email us at my website, drnancyhealth.com. You can, you know, you can find all this information, but also health office at drlonsdorf, drlonsdorf.com. You can send us an email and, and we'll be in touch with you and talk to you more about that. Also this, I don't know if everyone can see or if my picture is, my picture is, pro there we go get my picture off a little bit. So we got our phone number 641-469-3174. You can call us and we'll get back to you and talk to you about any questions that you have. And interestingly, um, it turns out that, you know, pulse diagnosis is an important part of understanding your dosha balance and imbalance. And I've discovered something over the years that is a, an amazing uh, benefit to having a, a consultation actually over the phone or over a video call because I teach my clients, my patients, I teach them how to feel their pulse and I ask them questions that give me some additional verification about their dosha balance. And it's amazing what people will know and n derive from their pulse right away the first time I teach them. And then that technique they have to use as a self healing technique throughout their daily routine, they can take their pulse and I teach them exactly how to do that properly. And it's a self-healing to put your attention back on your physiology through the pulse. Wonderful. Um, Dr. Lonser, if we do you have time to answer just a few questions for us? Sure, I'd love to. Okay, we have a ton of questions that came <laughs> in. So um, I'm gonna try to get to a couple of them here. We have someone that wrote in that says, when you mentioned classic AMA, she felt that she, that you were speaking right to her. She's experienced allergies, asthma, and heaviness. And her question is, um, what time is best for exercise for her? And maybe some tips for what type of exercise would be good. She says she thinks she's pitta predominant as well. Okay. Well, it turns out that for any body type, and there's research on this now, uh, the worst time for exercise, and I would say for pittas, it's probably even worst, worst, is around lunchtime. And I know pitta types who will go out and play tennis at lunchtime, or they'll, uh, I, when I was in my psychiatry residency, um, the group that I was working with would go out for a run around the um, complex at lunchtime. And the research shows that if you exercise vigorously at lunchtime, your heart rate during the night and your blood pressure does not drop the way it should and give your body rest and your heart rest at night. Whereas if you exercise like Ayurveda says, either in the early morning, six to 10, or in the early evening, six to 10, that then your blood pressure during the night will drop in a normal, healthy fashion and maybe even be enhanced especially from the morning exercise, which I already says is the ideal ideal. Uh, so that's a very good question. And I would encourage you and everyone to try to fit exercise in in the morning. That would be the ideal. Or then try in the early evening, like by seven o'clock, finish by eight, so you don't interfere with your sleep by exercising too much before bed. Okay, so then another question, and I assume this relates to Alma, um, and the idea of overeating and somebody asks if you have any suggestions to help stop overeating Overeating is usually due, you know It's always evaluated individually, but I would say ayurvedically speaking. It's usually due to two things one is mental stress and people um, coping with the stress by eating especially carbs or sometimes salt because usually stress Classically, you know, mental pressure is vata increasing and or pitta. So sweet balances both vata and pitta. So sometimes people just turn to food and they create, you know, help support their neurochemistry through 
overeating carbs, for example. But the other main thing is that they're creating ama from their food and they're not truly satisfied. So they end up eating a meal and they feel still hungry. They go to the refrigerator and open the door and look and like, what more do I want? Or they go to the cupboard, what more do I want? That's another reason. Actually, I'm going to give you a third reason that people don't eat enough early in the day. And this has now been verified with, with um, research that we should eat the majority of our calories before 3 p.m. And then we will be able to lose weight more quickly and in greater quantity than if we eat the majority of our calories, same number of calories, but the majority of them after 3 p.m., we will not lose weight as easily. Our metabolism is different in different times of the day. And there's a syndrome of people like they're trying to be on a diet, they're trying to be good, so they run out the door in the morning and they don't have anything to eat or they grab a cup of coffee or something. Then lunchtime, you know, quick uh, bite, the like salad. Wow, I'm doing really great. You know, by five o'clock, I've been, I've been up for 10, 12 hours and I've barely eaten any calories. So they hit home, they're extremely famished. And, you know, they start to grab something, say they go home and they're going to cook something. They start grabbing, they're eating all the time, they're cooking something. And then they eat the meal and they're still, their body still feels deprived. It's still in that kind of like, oh, I was starving mode. And then they eat snacks in front of TV or in the computer, like into the evening. That's the worst. Not only are you overeating, you're not giving your body nutrition when it needs it during the day. So you're kind of starving yourself. You're weakening your metabolism. And then when you eat it at night, your body can't cleanse at night. There's a cleansing cycle. Even Western medicines discover the intestines cleanse. They, they, they clean themselves at night. And probably they're going to find the liver goes through detox at night. And when you put in a bunch of food before you go to sleep, you block that because the body is trying to digest the food and it inhibits the natural rhythm of cleansing. It's like bringing in groceries when you're trying to clean the house. No, it just doesn't, doesn't work. Okay, that's amazing information, thank you. Um, okay, and then let's just get one more question here. Um, we had somebody ask ahead of time, so we wanted to get to this one. Um, this this uh, customer says that she notices a really big shift this time of year. And she's curious as to whether this shift could affect her emotions as well. She says all the things that she does normally, yoga and meditation and eating well, she says it doesn't seem to be as effective now as it was two months ago. That's so interesting. Um, if you were, she were in front of me, I'd ask her, well, what are the emotions? You know, what's coming out? What is, what is the experience? And Ayurveda tells us that when the body goes through this spring kind of natural flow of impurities out, it can also go through a cleanse of emotional, like suppressed emotional stress. So we might find ourselves a little more sensitive or moody or going through maybe a little melancholy, things like that. Um, and also as we get into the hotter weather, sometimes people feel more of the pitta or the fiery emotions come up, like more irritability. And for that, I wanted to suggest that actually Mappy is doing, um, I think they're releasing an article in their next newsletter um, about Pitta emotions, how to balance those as we go into the summer and through the summer. So you can refer to that. There's a lot of good information in that. But yeah, one of I think one of the things you can do is be more self-reflective, try to put less pressure on yourself and kind of be just wa watching and understanding that that is a natural purification. Maybe it's drawing attention to something you should put attention on. Maybe it's some kind of self-care you need that you weren't giving, or maybe it's some something in a relationship and you need to have a talk with somebody. So anything that you've been kind of suppressing and has been tight, closed in and frozen in the winter, it's going to start melting and it's going to flow out and make itself known. So just uh, deal with it in a, in a comfortable way. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Lonstor, for your time tonight and for joining us. And we had a lot of people chat in that they enjoyed the webinar. We had someone that said this was the best webinar, Ayurvedic webinar they've ever seen. Um, and so you can catch the, uh, the live replay on YouTube and uh, we'll provide those links to everybody after we sign off. So um, all of Dr. Lonsdorf's contact information is here listed on the screen. 
um, or visit drlonsdorf.com or mapi.com um, for more information on all of this content. Thanks so much for everyone to tune in. Bye-bye. Good night. Thanks for coming.